Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Happy New Year and welcome to 2022. I didn't know if we'd ever see the day, but I'm Dan alongside Matt and we're back. Hey, we actually have Flames games to cover. Hold you know, the I phone. Was- I, I was talking to a friend of mine who was talking about an NFL team. And he, he went to his first NFL game recently. I said, you know, one day I'd like to be part of a team that has an avid fan base. Yeah, it, it's one of those things that, you know, it's nice to see other teams around the NHL enjoying their favorite teams actually playing hockey games. Um, well, we're playing. We're just not playing here. And I, I was asked by a friend of mine recently, Matt, what I thought of the new arena deal. I said, why do we need a new arena if we're just playing on the road? Yeah, exactly. We can be we like can, the Cleveland Spiders of old, you know. Like we can we can, we just, can we can save the city millions of dollars and just play all our games in the road like the Flames yeah. are now. Yep. Like the Harlem Globetrotters, we'll just trot the world and play hockey. Yep. <laughs> well, we've got five games to talk about since we uh, talked last. We won't spend a lot of time on these because I don't think anybody cares about a recap of some of these games. But let's go all the way back to. Uh, end of December, just because this is a, a fairly significant game, and it's the first time the Calgary Flames and the Seattle Kraken met in the regular season. This was a six to four loss for the or six four loss for, or sorry six four win for the Flames uh, in Seattle is what I meant to say. That Seattle lost at home six to four, but six four win for the Flames. Um, I would say the most interesting part of this game probably the last couple minutes. There we had Mangiapane, Jared. McCann, Matthew Kachuk, and Noah Hannafin all score within about three minutes. Yeah, it, it, this was definitely one of those games where Calgary should have scored six and not really given up four. <laughs> um, it seemed like every chance that Seattle got ended up in the net. And, you know, the Flames persevered and managed to actually eke out the victory, but uh, clearly not their best effort in this game defensively. It uh, ends a four-game lost losing streak for the Flames, but Matt, after not playing for 10 days and coming off COVID, could we have expected much more from the team? Oh, no. And that's where, like, you know, it was beneficial for this team to play against a couple of weaker teams to start with, just because, like, if we were playing against some really good teams, that well, I think the Flames would have got laughed out of the building. You were saying that, you know, the Flames should have scored six here. And I what I had in my notes on this one was the Flames were in control in a lot of ways in this game, but it felt like Seattle just capitalized well on the Flames' mistakes. Yeah. And my question to you on this one, do you think up to this point, this was Milan Lucic's best game as a Flame this year? Uh, he's had a few good games this year, but this was definitely one amongst uh, quite a handful and in, ever-increasing for him. Uh, he's actually slowly looking like he might actually be worth the contract that he's getting. He's the best player on the Oilers payroll, or one of the best. Yep. <laughs> um, the next game after this was uh, coming into the new year, Calgary at Chicago. Calgary ended up winning 5-1 over Chicago, which they should have. 26 shots on goal in one period ties a franchise record set back in 1986. That's a long time, but that's also a lot of shots. Yeah, it, this was one of those where I think Daryl said, hey, the next three games are against three of the best teams in the league, and you're currently tied with Chicago. And you ha- you were outshot, I think, like 14-7 to seven in the first period. Uh, that's not good enough. Guys, uh, wake the hell up. <laughs> and boy, did they ever. Another interesting note here, apparently Daryl Sutter had to manage his bench differently, and we saw that with some of the player usage because some of the guys were still suffering from some of the aftermath of COVID. It sounded like there were some players that were out of breath or didn't feel like they could go. So I think part of that is good thing Calgary was up and was able to do that, but we did see some weird line combinations and guys getting more time in this game than we normally would have, especially near the end, and that's why. Yeah. Well, and to their credit, they actually did manage to secure four points in the two games that were absolutely vital that they collect points in. Um, it, it's one of those situations that anytime you're dealing with a weird, bizarre unknown of A, not playing for like three weeks and coming off a respiratory disease like this, like it, it's going to take a big toll and it's going to take some time for the Flames to get back up to snuff with their energy levels and consistency. 
And I think we saw some of that consistency issue in the next game. Calgary went to Florida to play the Panthers, a 6-2 to two loss for the Flames. We didn't see Sam Bennett playing for the Panthers in this one. Um, but I, I think, you know what, the Flames didn't play well, and even Daryl said after the game, Daryl Sutter, that if they play like this, there are no playoffs. Yeah. Well, and to be blunt, the all three of the games that they played on this Eastern road trip were just – absolutely abysmal and like there are, is literally zero redeeming factors out of any of it the goalies played bad the defense played bad and the forwards played bad i thought the flames started this game again in florida okay but then yeah. it seemed like florida pushed and the flames never pushed back yeah exactly when we got up two to one against the the panthers it's like oh we're actually doing all right and then they kind of took their foot off the gas and florida's like oh thank you for the game we appreciate that. And, you know, I mean, I, I have to I, I have to ask this. I'm talking about how lousy they played. Um, how often do you get 49 shots on net and lose the game? And not only that, lose the game 6-2. to two. It's a good point, yeah. I mean, Florida got 45. We gave up a lot of shots, but you should be getting more than two goals on 49 shots yeah and i think that's showing a little bit of some of the symptoms of what ails this team and like up until covid struck the this team got by i think a lot with just hard daryl sutter hockey plenty of hard work skating forechecking and that but you know with when that's not there uh, the lack of just finishing talent on this team becomes more and more readily apparent. Yeah, the depth scoring we've talked about before. Um, and then the next game, the Calgary Flames on the 6th of January went to Tampa Bay to take on the reigning Stanley Cup champions. And I don't know if we can sum it up better here, but the Flames got beat by a better team. I mean, the, the Flames looked good enough to beat some teams, but you're not going to beat Tampa Bay with that game. Oh, no. And, yeah, like, they, they were just completely outclassed. And This like shows they, why they Tampa Bay is such a good team. Though. Yeah, and, like, to be fair, the Flames did kind of hold their own in keeping the score tied until after the halfway mark of the game. It's just that, like, once they actually did break through and Corey Perry scored that goal, uh, it's like the Flames didn't actually have a response to them and then when they scored the second and then the third and then the you know it just everything spiraled i thought that they played better than florida i thought they played a, a good game for what we'd seen from the flames since covid but not enough to beat the powerhouse uh lightning no and like anytime you have a team like the lightning like you have to be coming in full speed ahead just to have a shot and the flames weren't up to snuff yet and that's just between the time off and the illness. It's one of those where, yeah, you you should have done better, but it's understandable why you didn't. And credit to Dan Vladar in this one. He was facing some of the best shooters in the league and coming in for really a second game in a row. And I thought as much as, yes, he let in four goals, I don't know if there's any of those he could really ask for back or say that he would do something different on them. I think maybe only one of those was his fault. Yeah, and even then, it was kind of marginally his fault. Like, yeah, the, the, we've liked Vladar all season. I think this is really that sense of what's he got when you put him in there against the, you know, the Lightning. Yeah, and he, he has to grow as a goaltender. Like, it's easier to beat the teams like the Chicago's, like the Seattle's. But you know, like if you're playing like actual top flight teams, you have to find a way to elevate your game as well, and. You know, that's what separates starting goalies from backups. Good point. And the Flames played back-to-back, -back, another back-to-back -back against a hard team. Usually when we see back-to-backs, it feels like there's one harder team and one easy team. But uh, in this one, we had two hard teams. The next night, we went to Carolina, of course, still on the road, and ended up playing the Hurricanes. Uh, this was the... Uh, the Hurricanes scored 6-3. They defeated the Flames for their fifth straight win in this one. I would say the biggest uh, maybe change of the night for the Flames uh, was their change in lines. And we saw the, the first line, Sean Monaghan put back in that first line. It was Goudreau, Monaghan, and Mangiapane on the first line. So 
Daryl Sutter trying some different things there. Well, and that's the the key. Like when things are going on like this, you gotta try and find anything that might spark anything on this team. And unfortunately, it didn't turn out. And apparently, the lines that we saw in practice at F Check, I want to say uh, yesterday, was Goudreau, Lindholm, Gachuk back on line one. Line two was Coleman, Monahan, and Mongepani. Line three was Dubé, Backlund, and Richie. And line four, Lucic, Lewis, and Rajichka. So Sean Monahan being looked at uh, a little bit more for what he's known for, which is being that driving center. Yeah, and hopefully he can start asserting himself a little bit more five on five and such. So, yeah, I mean, not a, I thought in this game the Flames had a great first period, I thought. I really liked their first period, especially coming after what we've seen. Was it their best first period? No, but based on the team they're playing and what we've seen, I thought it was a great first period response after the Tampa Bay game. Yeah, and it's one of those, like, after this five-game segment, if you said to us going in that we'd be two and three, it'd be like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, it's unfortunate that you know timing wise that those three teams happen to be at that spot on the schedule but you know the flames played okay enough and you know it was an adequate performance by this team and especially all the other factors combined you know there's only so much you can do so right now in the Pacific Division, the Calgary Flames have the least number of games played because of our COVID shutdown. We're at 17, 10, and 6 for 40 total points. The teams above us are San Jose and L.A., both one point above us, Anaheim at 46, and Vegas at 48. So the Flames, I wouldn't say falling out of contention because we don't have the same number of games played, but I think, Matt, we're starting to see really what this Flames team is. And, and I would say... They really haven't played their A game since before the shutdown. Do you think that we're starting to see them regress to the mean or show us really what this team is, or do you think they're just on a bit of a slump? Well, in terms of talent, I think this is what the Flames are. Um, just say middle of the road. Like, they have some pieces that are good, some that aren't. But for uh, years, we've been talented on paper, and it's never translated. Uh, but, like, the difference, like, in the first couple of months of the season is that the Flames' work ethic and skating was up near the top of the league. And, you know, uh, that's where a lot of the wins, because they were literally just outperforming the other team in all the small areas. And uh, since so how do you get back, that back? How do you get those guys to start working like that and skating like that again? Uh, I think that's just a function of time, frankly. Uh, the Flames have missed so many games and so much time due to circumstances that are completely beyond themselves that, you know, it's just hard for them to turn that switch on. And it's one of those where, like, over the next handful of games and into next month, this team is going to have to learn how to reassert that consistency if we take a look at the schedule uh, for the next couple of weeks, the and we'll talk. Well, let's just get into our scheduling discussion. Um, the Calgary Flames play tomorrow night, the day that most people will probably hear this, Thursday night against Ottawa. The Vegas game is canceled. The Florida game, it sounds like, will probably happen, but who knows? And then there's uh, three days until the Edmonton game, so they will play. We'll have what one, two, three, four days before their next game, and then three days after that before they play Edmonton. So a lot of time at home, and I think that's one thing this team might need as well is just some some time at home. They've been on the road since Christmas. They've it's hard to get your game together. I think when you're on the road and you're um, you know you're not in your own barn, you're not getting regular practice time. Do you think that just having them home and having that time to go through the motions and go through the reps is going to help with that, Matt? Yeah, well, this team uh, really just needs uh, uh, any semblance of normalcy. You know, like the last month and a half of the Flames season, frankly, has been perhaps their most bizarre month and a half in their franchise's history. When's the last time you had a team finish a game and not know when or where they were playing next? Yeah, exactly. Like, it, it, you know, we're not in the early 1900s. We're going to get on an airplane. We don't know where it's going to go to, but we're going to get on this airplane. Yep. 
it's a mystery. <laughs> That's right. You know, um, instead of like the mass singer type things, you got the mask team and, you know, who are we playing tonight? You know, and I think, I mean, players in the NHL are very habitual, right? They have their game day ritual. They know how practice day works. So I think they're probably a little bit out of sorts as well because that's changing. They don't know what practice looks like. They don't know what game day looks like. And I think once the schedule's finalized and we can get the schedule nailed down, I think we'll be able to get some more, um, you know, some more routine going with these guys. Yeah, well, like especially if you're looking into the next month in February where – most of that was taken off for the Olympics. The fact that they're not going gives a nice three week window where a whole bunch of these games can get rescheduled if it makes logistical sense. So, yeah, it's Matt, just... if you're if you're a guy like Brett Ritchie or Milan Lucic or Trevor Lewis, who you know you're not going to the Olympics, do you think these guys have insurance on their trips to Cabo that they're not going to go on now? Well, I you know it's one of those where. They might have to send their wives with other people to get, you know, use of the All the wives tickets. can go together. Yep. Um, and just on the on the topic of the schedule, uh, Brad Tre Living came out earlier this week and said to expect no further postponements. So the last game that we think will be postponed is this Saturday against uh, the Vegas Golden Knights. And after that, he says no more postponements. Don't expect any changes to the schedule for the in January. The January schedule is pretty much set, and really there's no time to add games now. Um, but he says expect by the end of this week that we should see a new schedule for February and beyond if needed. I mean, there's really no time in March to play games. No time. A few games could be stuck into April, but I would expect Flames have lost 10 games. They can make that up in February. So if you're listening to this the week that we're recording – the week of the 12th uh we should know by the end of this week or he said at the very latest early next week what our february schedule will look like yeah and just from a logistics standpoint like you don't want to get to the end of the season with one team that needs to go and play seven or eight games just to figure out if they're a in the playoffs and b who are they playing while everybody else has to sit on their posterior waiting for the flames and anybody else needing to play their mop-up games yeah and the and the league is committed to playing 82 games this year i mean there's a lot of money that goes in these games with sponsorships with all sorts of things that they can't just cancel games they're gonna have to find a way to get everybody 82 but i think if we start pushing this into may now you've got other sports and stuff that are in these venues i think you get even harder to schedule at that point yeah and that's where it's like now or never so to speak and yeah it'll be interesting to see how things unfold over the next couple of months. So right now the Calgary Flames are ninth in the Western Conference. Do you think that ninth is about right for this team? Do you think that's about where they'll stay? Do you think they're going to go up from there, down from there? Kind of as we look at this at the mid, not quite the midpoint in games, but sort of the midpoint in months in the season. What do you assess for the Flames from that perspective? Well, the thing is, is that despite being ninth, it's a little disingenuous because like if the Flames go four and six, or four and two in their next six, um, they will actually be in first in the West again. So like, it's not like, like yes, they are ninth, but like they have six games in hand on Vegas, and you know, and like, we have seven more games this month. Yeah, so like it, it's one of those where, yes, and and I think that like this team is still better than a non-playoff team. It's just that uh, between the uh, effort levels not being there since they cut, got back and uh, just the uh, lack of a secondary scoring touch is going to hamper this team but you know to what extent is up to the players in the room yeah I agree with you I don't think we can really assess them right now with 33 games I mean there's a few other teams that have 33 games Minnesota does too they're above us but we need to sort of play out this month and get back on track with everybody else before we can make that decision but I think I think the blooms off the rose in some ways we saw the flames you know number one for a little while I don't think that's sustainable with the way we're seeing this team play I think this team will be a playoff team But I think unless they make some changes soon, not at the deadline, but before that to bring in the secondary scoring they need, I think they're going to struggle to hold a top spot. Oh, and I agree. And like the Flames have, it's just like last season where they have too many bottom six wingers 
that just are not really of an NHL caliber in their performance. Yeah, no, that's, a, I think, a fair assessment. And as much as I don't think, you know, you want to make a trade, I don't even know with some of the COVID restrictions what a trade looks like, what quarantine rules are right now. But I think as much as you don't want to disturb your core, I don't know that you're going to get as far as you want without disturbing your core. Yeah, and it's one of those you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. And if the Flames decide to stand pat, well, that's kind of indicative to guys like Adro and Kachuk that, like, you're not serious about... Like, especially with how good they've been playing this season, that you're not committed to actually taking those next steps. And, you know, like, that does impact that kind of thing. And this team needs to start to move on in terms of either, you know, picking a direction, going all in, and getting a good score or two, or, okay, play out the season and then reevaluate from there. Well, this brings us to an email we got from a new listener of the show. A listener named Al emailed us. So, Al, thanks for getting in touch with us. We always love uh, listener feedback. You can email us, contact at firesidechat.ca. You can email us through our website, firesidechat.ca. You'll see a link to do it. On Facebook, we're facebook.com slash firesidechat. Or on Twitter, we're at firesidepodcast. Any of those, we'd love to hear from you. But Al said, hi, guys. We kept hearing from various players, and I think the coaches, to how these past three games were a, a measuring stick. Given we didn't measure up very well, what do you see as the consequences and how is it? how easy is the market currently for trades? So let's address that one piece at a time. What do we see as the consequences? I don't know if there are any consequences right now besides, you know what, you're going to fall in the standings. I mean, you, yeah. you, the, the consequence I think is maybe they learn they have to play differently. And I think that is, as much as we don't have that secondary scoring, maybe we got to start playing more of a shutdown game, but I think it's really going to let you, and we even saw it with that Carolina game, putting 13, 23, and 88 together. I think maybe your consequence becomes, you've you've got the lineup you've got, how can we use it differently? And I think maybe we'll see more exploration from there. Yeah, and I think that like as a consequence of that, I think that you would start to see guys like uh, Peltier being recalled to possibly provide some measure of offensive spark. And, yeah, like, it's hard to nibble around the edges when, you know, your problem is not just skin deep. Well, and even on the idea of Peltier or some of these guys coming up, um, I don't know if you saw the recent comments from Daryl Sutter, but Daryl Sutter even talked about how there's a big difference between the NHL and HL, especially for undersized guys like Peltier, and he kind of... Uh, said here, here's a quote from Daryl Sutter, quote, I think it's really important as an organization we do a thorough job of development. You don't just call guys up and then not let them have success. You want them to have one or two years of success for sure. It's a big jump. You're looking at Jacob, right, and saying, well, he's up there in scoring. Well, there's a big difference between the American Hockey League and the NHL, especially if you're a first-year pro and you're undersized. Jacob Peltier is an awesome, awesome kid. He's got a great mindset for the game and energy for the game, but it's quite a bit different. If you're not an elite, elite scorer at this level, such as somebody like Johnny, and you're playing against guys that are 40 to 50 pounds bigger than you, you're going to have trouble. You've got to yeah. mature and develop, and that's just and that's for sure what Peltier will do. So Yeah, and you look at like a guy like Brad Marchand, who is very similar in approach as Peltier, like it took him a, a little bit of time to adapt to the NHL game as well, and you know he was quite able to, but it it wasn't an instant success for Marchand either. When he first entered the league, he needed to learn how to play that good two way role, and uh, Peltier is very much going to need to experience those growing pains over the next few months. And Chris Anderson of Post Media asked Daryl Sutter about the dangers in rushing players up to the NHL. And Daryl uh, quoted, Losing confidence, losing basically the experience of having success. You lose years. Look at the two boys here that, for example, a guy like Mange. There's a lot of similarities, to be quite honest, when you when you talk about that. Mange and the success that he had and the success he's having. It's because of the maturity and the experience. Then you look at somebody like Dylan who's had some good success, and at times, everybody, they say, well, the coach didn't like Dylan or whatever last year. But that's really not true. It's just experience and maturity the players need. Usually you're best served, I know from my own experience, I was best served playing in the American Hockey League and becoming a really good player 
there before going to the NHL. When you look at every at, at everywhere, there's very few players that step in. And those who are elite that step in under age or 1920, it's hard reading a Daryl Sutter quote. Or 21 for that matter, and even with defensemen, it's even longer. We can talk about that too. You guys like Val, right? It's got nothing to do with other than experience. He was probably here too early. It's better you play a lot to have confidence to feel good. End quote. Matt, I think that goes to something you and I have talked about, which is don't bring guys up for the sake of bringing them up. Bring them up because, A, there's a position for them, and bring them into the position you're going to put them in. If you're bringing a guy up for the sake of making a change, you bring up a fourth-line guy. You bring up a Pospisil or a Tulola or somebody who, you know what, they've probably hit that ceiling. I don't know if you bring up a Peltier or a Zari right now where those guys fit in the lineup. And I'm not sure that bringing them onto a fourth line role is going to help anybody. No, and it's one of those situations where the, this team kind of just needs to be both patient and impatient. And like, okay, if those guys aren't coming to the NHL, we have to find player X and player Y to fill the two spots. And when you say, um, it, you know, if they're not coming to the NHL, I think you also have to project out how far you think they are and bring in those NHL guys to fill the void in the meantime. If you think Peltier is three years away, then you know you've got to go sign a three-year deal. If you think Zari is two years away, then you've got to go sign someone on a two-year deal. Those guys are coming, but they might not be coming this year. They might not be coming right now. And, I mean, when I look at it, Matt, let's do a little bit of a thought experiment here before we answer the second part of Al's question. If you bring in Zari, who do you take out of the lineup? Or if you bring in Peltier, who do you take out of the lineup? Because it's kind of hard because of the well, fact me, that so many... Through, so let me many go through the, the lines here. Yeah, because the problem is, is that there are so many specific players that are kind of underperforming that it's like, well, which one do you take out? And Okay, well, let's go line by line. Goudreau, yeah. Lindholm, Kachuk, nobody comes out. No. Coleman, Monaghan, Monjapani, you don't take out. No. Uh, Dubé, Backland, Ritchie. Uh, Richie maybe, but I think that he's but kind what, of the coach's pet. So. But even then, is are you really doing anybody any favors putting, let's say, Jacob Peltier with Backlund and Dubé? Uh, yes, just because uh, Backlund is a good defensive steward that, you know, you can kind of protect the kid. But if bit. you're going to be, yeah, maybe. But I think if you're going to bring up a guy in that role, I'd rather see different guys. Oh, I agree. Lucic, Rujicka, and Lewis. I mean, in that case, you'd take Lewis out. But again, putting one of those guys with Rujicka and Lucic, you don't bring up Zari for that. You bring up, I don't know, Byron Ferrosi for that. Yeah, exactly. Like, there's a bunch of other players that make a lot more sense. And, you know, it, it's just frustrating that, like, just like last season, the bottom six ads uh, from uh, this past offseason have all been kind of rather disappointing for the team. Which is unusual because the defense ads were both uh, rather good. The bottom six ads, I think, are better on paper than last year, but I think we've got to get more out of them. I mean, Rajichka stuck around. He's looking good, and he's fighting his way into the team. But really, if we look at the guys that are on the line, that are in the lineup right now, of those guys I mentioned, really the only guy that wasn't here last year was Lewis. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, it's not even the bottom six ads. It's the bottom six, period. I think we're getting a better season out of Lucic this year so far than we did last year. Oh, yeah, for sure. I think Dubé's what we expect Dubé to be as a third-line winger. Yeah, give or take. I th I think Brett Ritchie is... I would probably not play him on the third line, but I think a good enough guy to be in your top 12 on a checking line. Yeah. So really the only guy that's in the lineup that wasn't here last year is Lewis, and I would say Lewis is performing as expected. Yeah, I can agree I mean, with that. you know, it, it's not the guy I would maybe bring in, but when you brought in Trevor Lewis, I think we're getting exactly what we thought we'd get with Trevor Lewis. Yeah, exactly. Same thing with Good Branson. I would say, you know, on the back end, performing as expected. If, if it was report card time, that's probably what the teacher would write in there. Daryl Sutter will send a report card to their moms. Yeah. Answering the second part of Al's question here, how easy is the market currently for trades? Do you want to answer that first, Matt? I think that... Your thoughts? The market is always shifting, and I think that it's just simply too early. Uh, like, you don't see, like, the tanky teams 
already, you know, lining up to sell whomever. Um, it's just, yeah, like, I think we're still a few weeks away from any of that kind of, you know, like, a say, like a Tyler Toffoli leaving Montreal type of thing. Like, you're not seeing Montreal quite uh, yet throw in the towel. I think you're right on that. No one's thrown in the towel yet, and I think you'd have to make a hockey deal. But when I when we talk about the trade market, we have to look both at the other team and at us. And my big question right now, if we're going to make a trade, what do we have to give up that somebody wants that we want to give up? Well, and that's where you run into a little bit of problems because like, on defense, pretty much the only viable asset that you'll get anything for is Valimaki which is not ideal. Um, up front, there's not really, other than the big couple of first-round draft picks, uh, Peltier, Zari, and uh, Coronado, uh, there hasn't really been uh, too many blue-chip caliber prospects that are champing at the bit to be in the NHL. So, And if you're moving those guys, I mean... I... <laughs> If you're gonna move one of those guys, you're not getting a bottom six. Pl- you're you're hopefully getting more than a bottom six guy. Yeah, that's kind of like a package start for uh, Eichel level and I don't, player, and not. And I don't think that right now it's time to mortgage the future. No, and it's one of those where like the Flames need to be creative and add without spending a lot, and whether that's picking up the useful middle six guy at the deadline. Or perhaps a free agent signing, or you know, yeah, s- some but, way. But of... to answer Al's question, though, those aren't moves you'll probably be able to make yet. Like I think no. the most, I think the the player on the roster that, get, and I don't want to see Tree starting to move high picks. But I think he's already moved too many picks this year. But that's just me. Um, I think the most tradable asset is Monahan. But if they could trade Monahan, they would have done it already. Yeah, and you have to look at, like, you know, with his six-plus million dollar contract, like, there are only so many teams that can actually eat that. And with the lack of production that you're getting out of Monaghan, like, that would be red major red flag number you would one. Have to, you'd have to pay somebody to take him off our hands, and I'm not sure I want to do that. I think he's serviceable enough that I don't want to pay someone to take him off our hands. Well, especially because of the fact that it's not like his offensive skills vanished. It's just that uh, more or less the speed has shrunk quite a bit. If he had three, four, five years, I might feel different. But he's got, I think, this year and next year on his deal. So I feel like we can. he's serviceable enough for two years. Yeah. So to answer Al's question, and you can tell me if you think the same to sum it up or you want to sum it up differently. But Al, I would say... I don't know that the market is there to make a trade because I don't know that we have anything to give up right now. And like Matt said, the pieces that we would want to bring in are not going to be available probably till near the deadline when you have a little bit more cap room and those teams have declared themselves as out and wanting to give something up. I think right now you'd have to make a hockey trade and I just can't find a team that I think would want to make a hockey trade with us. No. And you know, like, realistically, the only one that might would be Toronto, just because we're more deep on the blue line and they're more deep up front. And so trading from an area of strength for an area of strength might work. So what would you, what would you see there? Like, which of our blue liners would you give up? Well, and that's where you run into some trouble. It would probably be Valimaki plus. And see... I, I, the fact that Valimaki is back in the American Hockey League, I don't know that you're going to get a ton for him. Um, I know, and that's where you're running into issues just overall. Like, I mean, you, Toronto doesn't want Zadorov, doesn't want good Branson. We don't want to touch Shillington or Tanev, Hannafin or Anderson. Do you think we could trade Michael Stone and then bring him back on waivers or something since he always seems to end up back here somehow? trade stone to toronto get a ford they'll put him on waivers we'll bring him back since he always yeah. seems to end up back in the dome well you know and yeah it's just um frustrating because like there have been a couple of guys that have been available like if the flames needed some depth forwards that could have been useful but you know like who wants nick ritchie or uh rem pitlick um 
when we got well, their that, brothers. And at that point, I think that it's a question of are you improving or are you just swapping bodies? And not say yeah. swapping bodies can't be a good thing since we need that, but yeah. is Rem Pitlick better than Trevor Lewis? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe he performs better with the guys he's with. But if we just want to swap bodies, let's try some of our older farm team guys. Let's try Justin Kirkland. Let's try Byron Ferrosi. Like, we have bodies to swap in if we just want a different body. Yeah, and, like, that's where... Like, at least for right now, and especially with all of the absences from COVID around the NHL, like, everybody is still kind of in it, even though they might not necessarily be. So it makes trying to nail down a specific idea even, you know, because, like, say, like, with Detroit, like, you have uh, Tyler Bertuzzi and uh, Dylan Larkin that would be good secondary scorers, or San Jose with a handful of their guys, but they're both in it ish right now and well and even if they weren't what are you willing to give up to get larson yeah well, i think really if we if we want to bring up and change bodies i think matthew phillips is the first guy you bring up yeah i think he's been around the organization long enough he deserves the shot yeah and it, it's one of those where <sighs> It's just going to be tough for the next few weeks until, like, the trade deadline, frankly, because both you have a weird situation where it, this season could go either way, and it doesn't really make sense to do your homework early in case it goes the wrong way, <laughs> you know. It, but yet, like, the thing is, is that, like, if you look at any given year... Like, the Flames realistically need two middle six wingers. And they don't need to necessarily be, you know, amazing superstar caliber talents. They just need to be competent, you know, like 40-ish point guys. And at the trade deadline, those kind of guys do come available for not very much. So, the issue, the issue I think the Flames are going to have, though, is it's got to be a rental. We're going to be yeah. taking on so much salary if we try to bring Goudreau yeah. and Kachuk back you can't do more oh, than yeah, one year no and that's where like it definitely in whatever case it's a one year you know which that uh, leads to a thing that you and I discussed prior to uh, the start of the episode uh, about a certain player who had some issues this week sure so let's talk about that uh, Evander Kane from the Maybe I don't even know what team he's most notorious for, but previously with the San Jose Sharks, I think where Flames fans will know him best from, has been released for not following AHL protocols and is now a free agent and taking calls. And the rumor is that the Calgary Flames have been kicking tires or at least have made a phone call. Now, just because you make a phone call doesn't seem mean you're interested. It could just be, hey, what's the ask? We're curious. And we know... Brad, Brad for living our GMs in on everything, but it's an interesting question. Matt, you've been, whenever I brought up Kane's name in the past, very against Evander Kane as a flame. If you could get Kane, let's start with what's the Matt. If Kane was going to become a flame, do you pay any more than league minimum? On uh, a one year. One year, one mil, I think would be I don't even about, think we've got a mil. I, I, I think you could. Uh, work that out. Like I, I think, think the Flames have enough room if you sent down somebody. That I, I think could. right now he's desperate enough. You take him at seven fifty or nothing. Yeah. You want a contract? Take what the nice man's offering you. Would you now have you changed your tune about Evander Kane? Would you want Evander Kane part of the lineup this year? Well, it's one of those things where, like, if it was for like signing him as a longer term piece, no, not at all. Um, but, you know, the Flames did miss out on the Eichel deal, which wasn't, you know, like that was just Buffalo liking Vegas's players more. The Flames still need that caliber of guy to come in. And, like, all of the personality issues with Evander Kane are still present, and he's still that much of a disruption in the locker room. Part of the reason why I didn't like the, the concept of that previously is because I didn't feel that the Flames' leadership and coaching were strong enough to be able to manage that kind of a guy in the locker room, um, and that it would have been sort of like how he was in Winnipeg, where kind of 
divvied up the whole room and like it made everybody angry and i think that there's a lot more leadership here first there um so you know it, on a one-year deal to finish out the season um sure uh i i don't think i would have ever thought i'd say that but you know it, he is a good 40 50 point guy and he won't cost you anything and you know you can just tell the people in the room that well this is a guy that you only have to put up with for until the end of the season so just you know focus on the hockey and you know let the sideshow be the sideshow and you know um it would be a cheap and effective way of helping to address some of the issues I agree with your comment on the leadership. I think with Daryl Sutter as the coach, he's not going to take a lot of crap there. And if you're bringing um, Evander Kane in at, say, 750000 or let's just say a million, like you said, um, I think that you're more readily willing to send him down or terminate that if he screws up again. At this point, I think Kane's looking for a second chance. And I think that if he signs somewhere at the Flames, he's going to do everything he can to keep his nose clean for the last five months of the season. Yeah. Because he and definitely does not want to go over to Russia or wherever, you know, because, like, nobody else will take him. Like, he's going to be wanting a, to another NHL job, and especially if he's a 50-60 point guy, you can stomach that, like, on a one-year, three, four million dollar contract, you know. It, and I think if he was being brought in as a top six forward, maybe he'd have a little bit more... I don't want to say leniency, but maybe the best way to put it is spotlight. I think if he's being brought in to be your uh, guy on your third line with Backlund and Dubé, and he screws up, nobody's going to care if he's here or not. No, exactly. If he's, you know, in your top six and he screws up, you really don't want to get rid of him because you need him in your lineup. Yeah, and either way, I think just because of the lack of real, uh, real acquisition cost, and un- you know, like, it's kind of kicking the can down the road a bit until, like, some of the bad contracts start coming closer to an end. Uh, like Lucic and Monaghan's, uh, specifically. Um, and even Backlund's. Like, they're getting closer to ending, and so you can... Just like when, uh, TJ Brody and all the rest of them, their contracts expired, the Flames were able to transition into getting other pieces that were a viable fit i think that you're gonna see that same kind of a thing but if you can manage to so basically have your cake and eat it too i i think that's a perfectly viable and good alternative uh at least uh, for the short term and you know always reevaluate and like if kane actually steps in and actually shows that he cares and is not completely self-absorbed you know and is actually showing some character growth you might look at bringing him back but you i know, don't think you could do more than one year right now no and uh, that's where you know it, it prove it basically and, and i think at the same time if he proves it i think he would end up walking because i think someone else would offer him more yeah and that's perfectly a-okay because you know like this offseason the flames will have plenty of opportunities you know because like say like a guy like milan lucic right with how he's played this season him getting 5.25 is not ridiculously out of line like he's playing about a four or four and a half million dollar player right now so it said milan lucic he's under contract yeah i know but he, he, him making 5.25 for one more year. Oh, I see. You know, like, he all of a sudden becomes a possible, actual, viable alternate for some teams that, like, if you are wanting to trade that cap hit to a team that's looking for that part to, say, push them over the, the top, you know, that it's, it, with how he's played... You know, it, it's no longer a boat anchor of a contract. It's, I see. So you're now, so you've now transitioned away from Kane, and you're now talking about freeing up some money to sign other guys. Yeah, it, it's a little bit of you know, like addressing the problems in the short term and in the long term. And you know, like in the short term, like we just need, you know, 
a good quality second third line guy but you know like it also with Gaudreau and Kachuk's contracts like that is going to require a lot of money and so you know in order to have a viable remainder of your team like you know the fortunate thing with Lucic playing as well as he has like he becomes a tradable player it's same with Monaghan well, to me, there's two separate discussions. Let's stay oh, on the short term. I think the long term is a different discussion of moving money and what we do with it. So let's, if we're going to talk about Kane, let's stay with the short term. You can bring Kane in for less than a million. You can fill that spot for one year. Yes, you're right. There's going to be potentially options we can move in the off season. We're going to need to free up money anyways. I think, and we can go that way. But to me, that's a different discussion than the Kane discussion. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think the other thing to remember about Patrick Kane is is as as much as goes on off the ice, he's still a good hockey player. Like his last full season in the NHL was 2020, 2021. He played 56 games and he got 49 points. Like this guy's still a very talented hockey player. Yeah, exactly. Like you're basically adding a Gaudreau level, a Kachuk level guy, you know, and that's where it's like, yes, there's this, the sideshow, but, you know, for everything else, why not? It, you know, like, you can, can kind of contain that portion of it just because of the fact that, like, the need for this team for a guy like Kane is just that desperate, frankly. And I don't know what you can do. I, I'm not an expert with contract law. I have somebody I could ask if we wanted to find out for next week. But I don't even know if you could almost put... I know you can put incentives on contract, which isn't quite what I'm talking about, but almost restrictions on Kane. Like, you know, you can you give the guy a curfew? Can you give the guy other things in a one-year deal? Say, hey, we're taking a chance on you, but here's the restrictions that are going to come with it. Yeah. I, I, don't, don't, I don't know I don't, what you're allowed I to do. I don't think so, but... Um... And even if not baked in there, can you do it unofficially? Yeah. And it's one of those situations that, like, even if, you know, nothing's changed and he's still as much of a sideshow, um, it's only for, like, how many weeks? 12 weeks? Mm -hmm. Like, that's not that big a deal, frankly. What I would do... And I think a million, what you said, is the right number because I want a number that I can bury in the HL with no cap hit. Yeah. And so even if even if you even if he screws up again, you send him to Stockton, he doesn't report. Now he's suspended. Like you just want a number that, or send him to Kansas City for all I care, uh, our ECHL affiliate. But you need a number that's not going to cost you a cap hit to bury it. Yeah, exactly. And you know that this team just needs the. Uh, needs a guy and just for sake of ease you know it, there's no acquisition cost yeah and that's where you know you're just you'd have to rely on the rest of the team to just be able to put up with it for a few weeks yeah and like you said we've got the leadership we got the coaching i don't think he's gonna be able to get away with much in the calgary flames organization no, and plus, you know, like, um, frankly, like, you can have Daryl sit down with him and say, well, hey, we're trying to win a Stanley Cup. You know, you want to redeem yourself. You want to earn another contract like the one you had. Go play like you can. And Yeah, and Daryl wouldn't be the only one having that discussion with him. I'm oh, sure no. his agent will have the same discussion, and a bunch of people have that discussion with him. Yeah, and you know go win the con smythe you know and be blunt with him because he does actually have the talent where he could do that but you know like in order for him to redeem himself he has to find that motivation in himself to then get another good contract to you know pay off his gambling issues but You know, it's one of those things that, you know, even though it's a huge distraction, like, for what you're getting and what you'd have to give up, like, to me, even with all of that, it's a no-brainer just because of, like, that's what this team needs. Uh, You know, um, like, there's no... (laughs) 
Where would you put him in the lineup? You can't put him in the top six. Like I, I don't think that he, you want to disturb your top six that much. Uh, actually, I'd put him on the second line with Coleman and and Monahan. Um, actually, I would. Uh, or with Monahan and Manjapani. I'd almost like to see uh, Manjapani being put up on the first line again with Kachuk and Lindholm, and then Gaudreau, Monahan, Kane at that point and see if you can't get two dynamite first lines basically going and then you know coleman backland dubé for your third line and do you think and i'm not disagreeing with you but do you think that bringing in a guy like that and rewarding him with top six minutes is setting the message you want for your dressing room uh how would you say it's like well, none of that you, the rest of you have... You had your chance and yeah. you blew it? Yeah, we're 33 games in, and we we have four guys who can finish. So, you're not one of those four guys. Oh, well, <laughs> you know. Well, at least try this guy. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it, it's harsh to be blunt, but, like, frankly, this team needs... You know, like if your name isn't Kachuk, Lindholm, Gaudreau, or Manjapane, like you're not really contributing offensively. A, a little yeah. bit. Like Lucic and Monaghan, a little bit. But everybody else has been abysmal this season. And, you know, like you just, that's why you need to go out and think about getting a Vander Kane. Like, frankly, like nobody would want a Vander Kane's mess unless they were desperate for something. And, like, the Flames are, frankly, desperate for scoring just anybody who can actually put the puck in the net. And, you know, Kane can do that. So, you know, it's a marriage of necessity. <laughs> and while you're talking about a marriage of necessity, let's say a million. I think a million's your your upper limit. Yeah. Do you think that there's going to be a team, let's say in Edmonton, who would pay more for that? Like, do you think it's realistic to think he'd come here at that price? Well, I honestly doubt any team. Like, if, there's not really many teams that have cap space anyway. Uh, a million, a million and a half is pretty easy to free up. Yeah, and like I, I'm sure that like if it came down to it, like the Flames probably could go up to two if you just sent like. A, the 13th and 14th forwards down you know you could do that i don't know that i want to start doing that for kane until he's proven himself i know it's one of those like especially with the taxi squad being back you know like you can kind of get away with doing that you know as of right now the calgary flames have two million seven hundred ninety three dollars three thousand four hundred seventy two dollars uh in cap space okay yeah so you could use a good chunk of that if need be and i mean i i'm looking at a team like edmonton who i think they are probably more reticent to bring a guy like that in to improve their scoring now if i was kane i wouldn't want to go to edmonton but if you want to stay out of trouble edmonton's maybe the better place to go well it also depends on like frankly like what uh kane actually wants from his uh well, and, and I don't know. I don't know. Like, I don't know, know he's gonna have enough offers to pick that. You know, and, well, and that's the thing. Like, if say, like you have several deadbeat teams and Calgary, at, you know, and Edmonton is a deadbeat team. Like, their mm -hmm. their team's broken in so many ways. It it's literally just plastic. Like, if it's not for McDavid and Drysaddle, they're the worst team in the NHL by a mile. So you know, like it it's one of those things that. You know, like, if you're looking at, like, what your destination is and, like, p probable trajectory, like, uh, most of the suitors that you've seen as rumored candidates are not very good teams. Do you think there's something to be said, though, about your reputation going to, say, a larger market or a larger U.S. market, maybe being one of your, say, top four on that team and showing I can do this, as opposed to coming to Calgary and being one of your middle six? Well, and like that, if you're trying to redeem yourself that way, well, it. How would you say, um, 
regular season kind of doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Like it does. I think but, it does if you're a Vander Kane and you're trying to rebuild your reputation that way. Yeah, you, it, but, you're probably not. You might not go to a team that's making it out of the regular season. Yeah, well, and that's the thing. Like, if you're and if and you're for content, him, you don't want to put up with this shit just for the playoffs with him. Like, he's got to be a a decent human being for 82 games. Well, and that's the thing. Like, if you're looking at like from Kane's perspective, like the regular season, it's great. And like, if you're being like a key guy on a bad team, your point totals are going to be slightly better than if you're, you know. But the playoffs is where players, you know, and he's been a decent playoff performer when he's had the ability to be in the playoffs. So it's one of those things, like, if he goes out and has a really dynamite playoffs, like, say he's a point-per-game player in a playoff season of, like, 15, 20 games, like, you're going to have, like, the entire NHL knocking on your door irrespective of your issues because of the fact that, you know, like, yeah, and... I don't know about that. The fact that he's in the AHL right now and he's cleared waivers a couple times in the last couple of years tells me the whole NHL's not knocking on your door or he'd have a new home. Yeah, well, it, also that contract was the, I, I think, I, is I the think, motivating. I think the league knows what he is as a player. All the GMs do. I think the question is, can you keep your nose clean? Regardless of playoffs, regular season, exhibition, off season, can you? if you're a Vander Kane, can you keep your nose clean? I'm wondering if going to a team like uh, Chicago, Washington, uh, Florida, who have some cap room, and showing, look, I can do this in a big city. I can behave myself for a big team. Hire me is more advantageous for him than going to Calgary, Edmonton, and being a good boy. Possibly. Or if going to Edmonton and saying, look, I can be a good boy and I can be that high-level contributor where maybe I'd be a middle six guy in Calgary. And that's one of those things that, you know... Uh... I think will be determined based on where he signs. But and not just a contributor on the ice, but I mentored young kids and on on the team. I went to the children's hospital. I you know kissed grannies. All those things that he needed to do off the yeah, ice. Yeah, the politicians' <laughs> handbook. That's right. I I helped old ladies cross the street on days we weren't playing games. I you know cleaned some old woman's house because she couldn't do it herself. Like I think that there. We know that the league, and especially the American media, looks at certain teams sort of as their their highlight markets. And I wonder if he might be better to go to a market that is a crappy team, but a better market. Um, I'm thinking like a Chicago, um, and, and even that, e- even the Islanders, where he's gonna it's gonna be more prominent that look he's being a good boy. Yeah, and I could see that. It's one of those things that like how, how would you say it? another factor is like you know. Um, looking at you know just like coaching staffs you know like if you're going to a daryl sutter team you know and like you're trying to redeem yourself like daryl's everybody knows daryl's a no bs kind of guy and he really doesn't care (laughs) about you know confronting you with that you know and it's one of those things that you might just as a counter argument that you know you look at a guy with that level of reputation and willing to go to that guy and play for his team you know because everybody's gonna say well hey daryl didn't launch him into orbit (laughs) so therefore you know because of daryl's reputation you know like if you know i know what you're saying but i'll say daryl's not the only coach in the league with that reputation no but there's also only a few that are and would be actually in the market. So that like that that's a counter argument ish. Yeah. yeah. No, I I mean I'm I'm not against them bringing him in. I'm just wondering from yeah. his perspective if Calgary would be his best market. And to be perfectly honest, probably not. And frankly. you know, on the flip side though, maybe it would be because again, maybe Calgary, Edmonton, Winnipeg, it's like I can't get in as much trouble there. Yeah. Because, you know, frankly, in terms of, you know, that kind of stuff, Calgary is one of the more boring cities in that area. So, you know, like... You won't be hobnobbing with celebrities as much, and 
I guess no, he could be a fr- he could be a frequent user of Cowboys Casino, but I, I think maybe it's more isolated and you know maybe it takes him out of limelight a bit. Yeah, and you know it's kind of quiet. It you know, and if you're trying to slowly rebuild yourself, you know perhaps being in a quiet place isn't the worst idea either. And we see players go the other way. I mean, we've seen players who've done bad go to U.S. cities like the Islanders, like Florida, because they want to get out of the Canadian press limelight. Maybe he wants the opposite. Maybe he wants to come here where he can't get as much trouble, but also have the Canadian press talking about what a good boy he's being. Yeah. And that might help the GMs next year with the reputation. So, uh, yeah, I could see it going either way. Yeah. And it's one of those things. It's just an interesting thing to talk about, especially because of the fact that like if you're looking at anybody anywhere near as talented as Kane is like you're looking at at least a first and a good prospect as a rental for that player so you know like Calgary like it would be stupid frankly for Calgary to spend that much on a rental for that caliber of player you know it's one of those like if you're going to get a rental for that second third line guy you're probably going to want to spend third and fourth round picks and miscellaneous prospects and i think you just brought up the important thing to remember a lot of people online have been sort of criticizing the idea of the flames why are they even talking to him why are they even kicking the tires he's a good hockey player i mean he's consistently getting 40 plus goals a year you'd be stupid not to at least inquire yeah uh it, frankly like the difference in terms of on ice performance between him and Jack Eichel is slim. Well, and, and Eichel's... We don't know what Eichel's going to be when he comes back either. We know no. at least what we're getting with Kane. Exactly. I would all say at 30, I think this is probably, you know, the end of Kane's peak. So I think bringing him in this year, you're probably going to get the the best Patrick Kane or the best of Andrew Kane you're going to get. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it's one of those things that why not? And... You know. Why not? But I wouldn't break the bank for it. I think you've got to come in with this is our offer, take it or leave it. I don't think you want to be paying this guy two, three million just to get him here. I think that there's other things they need some cap room for and some flexibility as well. Yep. And it's one of those things that, you know, it has to make sense on our terms, not on mm-hmm. his terms. And, yep. you know, like ours first. And then if it works for him, great. But, you know, the Flames it's one of those things that because of where and like how the flames have played when their work ethic is going that like if you can infuse a good player like a cane or a couple of all right guys that would be like in the you know decent second third line ish group then you know like this team might have a shot but when you're talking when you're talking about work ethic, I don't know why, but I got a flashback. I don't remember the guy's name. Who is the Ottawa goalie that went to the wrong practice arena, or so he said, years ago? Oh, Do you remember that? Yeah, Ray Emery. Yeah. When you're talking about work ethic, that's the first thing I thought of. Like the guy said he didn't know where practice was and he went to the wrong rink. Buddy, how many places do you practice? Yeah. Anyway, sorry, my brain was going on an agile tangent there. Yeah. Um. I'd say let's let's leave the Kane discussion. Let's see what happens over the next week and see oh, yeah. if maybe we can discuss that more going forward. But I wanted to, to bring up two interesting points here from an interview on the Fan 960 this week with Agent Rich Winter, who uh, represents both Mangiapane and Giordano. And this could bring us into that larger discussion you were getting to earlier about long-term contracts. I don't know if we want to go down that road this late in the show, but maybe we'll save that for next week. But just some interesting discussions about the Monaghan contract here. Uh, Rich Winter said he'll be advising Monaghan to sign a short-term deal that gets him to UFA sooner rather than a long-term deal the club likely wants to see. He said that, bluntly, he believes that uh, players that are age 27 or so have different priorities after a few years in the league, and he may want to look at other places as better ones to succeed in. This is nothing against either the Flames nor the City, but more on making sure his client has all the options available to him that he can. Not to extract more money necessarily, but just to be happy in life. So, Matt, I think that's kind of an interesting phrase here. We're saying he might want to look elsewhere. It's not about money, but it's about being happy in life. What is? What do you think he's hinting at there? Do you think he's thinking Monaghan might want to go somewhere where he's not a second, third line guy, maybe make a little bit more and be a good player on a bad team? 
Well, the thing is, is that Monaghan being on the fourth line for the majority of this season, it, we're actually seeing dividends from that. Like, he's actually playing with physicality now, and he's playing better defensively. And that was kind of the point of him getting placed on the fourth line. And I can understand the agent going, hey, he's did not I say a... Mon did I say Monaghan? This is Mangiapane's agent. Oh, well, you were talking about Monaghan, so... Oh. My bad. No, I meant... Uh, sorry, if I said Monahan, I meant say Mangiapane. Okay. Uh, well, so, 88. Yeah. Um, well, with Mangiapane, um, I can understand that because of the fact that the Flames are kind of in this weird quasi-state. Like, with Gaudreau and uh, Kachuk being up in the air, they're not being quite enough secondary scoring... You know, like, I can understand, like, if especially if the Flames go into teardown mode, like, it, it say, like, Gaudreau and Kachuk just decide to walk base an effect, then, you know, like, you're going into a rebuild. It makes zero sense for Manjapani to want to stay. Just because, you know, who wants to be the best player on a bad team when you could actually, you know, win a Stanley Cup somewhere? So, you know, like, it's one of those things where... I can understand that, but I am also figuring that the Flames, like, if they can get everything under wraps properly and are, like, continuing to be a good team, that both Manjapane and the Flames would want him here long term. I, I think it's just one of those where, because everything with Calgary is so blatantly up in the air, that it's kind of a, uh, yeah. Yeah. Let's assume, I think, realistically, you're not going to lose Goudreau and Kachuk. You might lose one or the other, but I don't think both. I don't think they tear it down this year. Um, I think if you're Manjipani, you know there's nowhere to go up. You're not going to overtake Kachuk or Goudreau in the lineup. So I think what he might be talking about with that, um, with the, what was it here, um, to, to be happy in life or whatever the agent said, I think maybe you want to go to a place where you might be able to be that first line winger. Cause I think Mangiapane knows he's perpetually second, third line in Calgary. Yeah. And like that, by the way, that was lending to my, part of my credence with, uh, like if the flames got Kane of throwing eat bread on the first line. But, um, it's one of those things that, uh, Calgary, it, he also has to improve, frankly. Like, mm -hmm. uh, like yeah, he's been amazing on the road. But mm -hmm. I think he's got one home goal. And, you know, like, that's... You can't have a guy that's, like, super amazing at, at one thing and then, you know, not really any different than Dylan Dubé when in Calgary like you need to have consistent production and if he wants to be that first line guy he needs to be that consistent player and he just hasn't quite found that gear yet and one could argue the other way I think too that is he going to be that guy playing with a rotating cast of characters and currently with Coleman and Monaghan on his line and maybe that's also what the agent's getting at is he might want to go somewhere where we can play with better players Yes, and, um, like, frankly, uh, like, if you look at Monaghan and Coleman and compare the to second-line guys around the NHL, like, frankly, that's probably on the north side of half for mm -hmm. second lines. So, you know, like, uh, there are not that many teams. But I think he's the kind of guy that would end up on the north side of half the league anyways. I know. But it's one of those where, like, frankly, like, there's not a lot of second line players that are substantially better than Monaghan and Coleman. So it's one of those where, yes, uh, but. Uh, you know. I guess, you know, when I'm looking at second lines, and I won't go through them all, but even if he were to end up on a second line with. Andrei Svechnikov and Vincent Trocek out of, you know, Carolina, I mean, that could bring your performance up. Yeah. It, and part of the problem with that kind of thought is that, like, those teams don't have the money because <laughs> they have to not sign now, their own guys, but, you know. Yeah. And, but like, at the same time, if, if that player's available, you might not sign one of your guys and think there's a better option. Yeah. And that's where, 
you know, I think it's color, a I, very I, tough I, situation because of the yeah. fact that, like, because frankly, like, if he continues to trend this way, Ebrard's going to be a six and a half, seven million dollar player when you know if he's signing a long term contract. Like, if he's and I mean, and, and honestly, we're not going to be able to afford that here. Oh, we might. We might. It, uh, you, it depends. If you keep if you keep Goudreau and Kachuk, you're not going to afford that. You might. It would just. Uh, change your priorities a bit around because like but by then you you have to figure that Backlund Monaghan and Lucic are on their way out in some like either their cap hits are going to be reduced if they're being re-signed or they're just gone and you know like you can kind of like reassess you know an exchange dollar I, for I dollar think- I think in that case, you'd have to work through with them on doing a two-year shorter deal, get some of those off the book, and then renew the longer after that. Yeah. Just because you, if you look at the AAV, even if you backload it, the AAV is still high, the average cap hit. So I think you'd have to do a short-term, almost a bridge deal to get him to that longer one. But like you said, he is still – I mean, he's not – the consistency is not there to be one of the top 10 players in the league. And his agent even said he thinks that Mangiapane could be one of the top 10 players in the league. And when I heard that, I thought, who's he going to usurp for that high of an honor? Yeah. Well, and put it this way, if he becomes that good, you break the bank for him. <laughs> but, you know, like we haven't seen I mean, seen I that like yet. the player, but he's, he's at that age where he's only got so many years of development left. And... If you look at those top 10 guys in the league, they're not slowing down anytime soon. No. And, like, yeah, his development curve is a little weird just because of, the, like, the late start in juniors, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, like, I don't see him quite getting anywhere near that caliber. But, you know, he's still a really dynamite player. It's There's still a need for a good middle six forward on any roster. Yeah. And even if he's a quasi first line player, like you know, that's fine too. It's just figuring it everything out, and it, it we're kind of in this situation like right now where we do not have enough information presently of what he is, what where the team's at, and like where any of the details are, frankly. And so it's just kind of uh, we have to wait and see, frankly, because it's just. Yeah. I, I think that with Monaghan or with Monjapani, like you said, he needs to show us more. He's a good player, but he is where he is for a reason. And yes, he looks good when he's with good players and he looked great at the world championships, but he needs to be consistent if he's going to, if we're going to say, okay, this is the guy that we're going to spend that much money on long term. Yeah. And, and he's 25. I'd say he's probably got two, three years left of his best years of his career. Yeah, like, could I see the Flames, say, signing him to, like, a six-year, 36 to $40 million contract? Sure. But, you know, it would depend on a lot of things. And, like, right now, he's not quite there for that. You know, he's more of, like, a $25, $30 million player right now for that level of term. You know, like a $5 million-ish a year player and you know it's just not quite there yet and just have to wait and see uh, you know the other interesting thing that rich winter said he was asked directly about mark giordano another client of his and if he thought it would be possible that giordano could come back this season and he interesting answer to this one i know a lot of flames fans have debated this uh, asked directly if he thought Giordano could come back this year and finish his contract as a flame. He responded, it's a possibility in that Brad and Daryl never wanted to lose him. Gio still owns his house in Calgary and Gio and Daryl both have huge respect for one another and Gio never wanted to go elsewhere. So, I mean, Matt, we won't get into, you know, long, it's a one year, so we won't need to get into long-term, you know, cap stuff after this year. But for Gio to come back, it's not going to be, Seattle throwing us a bone. They're not going to take a seventh form. Like, I don't disagree with the idea, but what are you willing to give up to get Gio back? A third round pick. We don't even have a third rounder this year. Oh, or equivalent. You know, like it. it What's the equivalency? Like, what is? What do you think that looks like? Uh, 
probably. Are you going to give a? You're not going to give a roster player. So what? I do, they probably don't want a third round equivalency out of the American League. Uh, possibly a guy like Ruzhitska, maybe. But uh, I don't know if that's a good long term move. No, and that's where. You know, maybe like a fourth and a seventh, something like, like if, that. Like, if you really want Gio back that badly, wait till the summer and bring him back as a free agent. Yeah. I uh, just don't know that it pays to give up an asset to bring back an aging defenseman who, well, I think r- right now when you look at it, who would probably be in your bottom three. Well, frankly, you know, if you're making that trade, it would be a one-for-one one Gio for Zadorov. And maybe but, adding a late pick. But do they want Zadorov? Uh, you know, you know, in terms of asset, Zadorov is the better long-term asset, just because you know. But again, they can or they sign could, Zadorov in the in the off season. Or they could flip him for you know, like, you know, in the door and then out the door at the same time. And I like, guess that's maybe the only way you do it. If you're Geo, you talk to the GM there and you say, look, I want to finish off this contract in Calgary. I'm planning to retire, whatever it might be. Can you send me back there at the deadline? We're not going to, we're not going anywhere anyways. Yeah. And, but, but my question is then are there other teams that might pay more for them? Possibly, but I think, uh, it's about what, Geo would want I think in that particular case and because of the fact that like he is so well respected in the NHL you know like if, if the Flames brought him back like I'd be fine with him in a lesser capacity like you know four five six guy you know not uh, like him on the top pairing at all or anything like that. Well, I think if you move him for Zadorov, I mean, that that's a perfect spot to slot him into. But, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to give up a young asset like like you said, Rajishka or even a guy like Pospisil or Tulola for a, an aging defenseman in our bottom three when our bottom three is not the issue. Yeah. Like, if we're going to use that asset, let's use it to fix the issue. Yeah, I agree. That's one of those, that's a nice feel-good add-on, sure, why not, kind of thing. But you do that in addition to... Because, like, frankly, like, in terms of the Flames' realistic shopping list, they need two middle six forwards. That's basically it. And competent middle six forwards. They don't have to be exceptional, but, you know, like, 40-ish point caliber guys that can actually just play. Both have to be rentals-ish, uh, and if you can get better for cheap, fine, go for it. But, you know, like, you're not going to be spending a ton of money on, or assets on those players. So if you can get that done and Geo, sure, why not? But, it, you know, priority number one and priority number two, definitely the two forwards. And then you, you know, if you still have time to play around... And shore that up, too. It's like, hey, awesome, fine, woo. <laughs> I'm not against Gio coming back, and I think Gio could be a great partner for Valimaki in the future. I think if we were to look at our fourth pair instead of Zadorov Good Branson next year as Giordano Valimaki, but I don't want to... I don't think you give up an asset. I think I would just play... I would just play the waiting game, wait for him to become a free agent in the summer, say, you know, we'll sign you to one more deal, come here, be a bottom six guy, and then retire after that. And, you know, that may be how it shakes out. I I think it... Frankly, I think it will depend more on how Calgary is doing at the deadline. Like, if the Flames actually are, like, kicking some butt and are, like, a top-tier team again, and, you know, like, top three in the conference, I think that you would have more of an onus to go do that and bring him back for the... You know, because Aginla didn't, you know, kind of thing. And so you're thinking you bring him back if you think you might make a cup run to get him his cup. Yeah, exactly. And it's one of those where if then, you know. And, and in that case, I think you could probably finagle Seattle into a sweetheart deal. Yeah. I- exactly. Like said, with how well respected he is. So sort of like Ray Bork getting traded just to win the cup. Yeah. It would yeah, be... I, I can see that. But if, if we're not in that position, no. I don't know if we will be. I don't know that you're trading Zadora for him. I don't know if that makes sense for anybody. Yeah. 
No, and that's where, like, that kind of a situation... Like, that's the only real scenario that I see that making sense, is if, like, the Flames are actually going for it again, and, hey, you know, it, as an honor thing, <laughs> you know, because, like, when Aginlo was in the end of his career, like, the Flames were not in a position where it made any sense. No, but I, if we, the Flames were in a position, I think they would have. Yeah, I think you're right. And the Flames traded Jerome to try and get him that cup. And I don't want to say that we're owed it, but we gave up. We got nothing for Jerome. Like, we kind of owe somebody giving them our crap for a good player. <laughs> yeah. Really, I mean, we got nothing for him. We got nothing for Bo Meester. Like, we kind of... When does karma come back around? What? You, you didn't like the careers of Kenny Agostino and Ben Hanowski and, in Morgan, that, in that, and Morgan Klimchuk and uh, Mark Kondari <laughs> and Red O'Bara? We'll, we'll give you Justin Kirkland and uh, Kevin Gravel for um, Mark Giordano. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Matt, I think that's the end of our of catching up on the Flames. This is a weird week for the prediction game. We have two games to predict. We think, um, maybe we our, we our, have... our prediction is: Do they play the games? <laughs> there you go. You get an extra point if they play both games. We have Ottawa tomorrow night on the thirteenth. Apparently, the Vegas game Saturday has been postponed, and we're supposed to have Florida on the eighteenth. So we will have a game on the thirteenth, and we'll have a four day break, then a game on the eighteenth. And then we'll record again on the 19th. So, two games, Ottawa, Florida, both at home. What do you think? Uh, Win-win, just because, you know, they need to win them both, frankly. And I think that I was... after getting skunked on that trip, that I think the Flames are going to be wanting to exact a little bit of revenge against the Panthers. And that game was quite chippy, too, so, like, they're really going to be annoyed. And that's one reason I think they might not win is I think they might get off their game and try to sort of get back at the Panthers and lose sight of what's important. Yeah. Could I be. also worry that four game four days off, they might get a little lazy. Yep. And that could very well happen. So I'm going to go win against Ottawa and a loss against Florida. If anyone listening to the show is in the saddle dome for either one of those, we'd love for you to come on Facebook, Twitter, send us an email. Let us know what the experience is like. It's limited capacity. Matt and I aren't sure quite what the rules are, but apparently you're allowed to eat, but not all the time. It might only be during intermissions. and We're not sure, but it's going to be a very different saddle dome. So if you're there, let us know what it's like. We'd love to uh, to hear some report from the post-apocalyptic Pengro saddle dome. It's going to be an odd couple home games. Yeah. It, well, this whole pandemic has just been completely But, I mean, bizarre. the Flames reopened fairly normally for most of the season. Yeah. Oh, I know. You know, like, the, the feeling in the Dome and being in the Dome was fairly normal. I mean, yeah, we were wearing our masks, but it felt very normal. It's going to be limited capacity, weird food and drink rules. Like, it, it's going to feel very different being in there. It's going to feel like being in an ECHL building. There's nobody there, and nobody's eating any food. Yeah. <laughs> or uh, what's the league below the ECHL? The SPHL? Where probably all the moms and girlfriends come, and that's about it. There's nobody in the stands. Good for you, honey. You scored. Yay. I remember going to Calgary Hitman, or not Calgary Hitman, Calgary Canucks game, and that was pretty much it. It was all the, the girlfriends and the parents. Yep. And the occasional scout from, you know, China looking for, for some talent. But anyway, uh, Matt, we'll talk to you next week. We'll see if Evander Kane's a flame or if uh, anything happens. And if not, enjoy the two games that may or may not get played this week. Yeah, and then maybe we'll have games next week and, or not. And, you know, we kind of well, have to... Brad, Brad said the December schedule probably won't change much besides postponements, so I doubt we'll add any, but maybe we'll be able to announce a whole slew of games next week. Yeah, it, it's going to be a bizarro world time for our show and the Flames. Like, what what's going on? Who we're playing? When... Yeah, who knows? <laughs> if we're, we're almost going to get like the a bat signal with the flaming sea on it. It's flash across the sky, and the guys get, grab their skates and run to the dome. Yep. Look, there's a game taking place. Quickly, yeah. to the ice. Who are we playing? Eh, who cares? <laughs> Doesn't matter. Just get to the ice. They're wearing we'll a different the... jersey. Hit them. <laughs>
That's right. Commissioner Sutter will flash the flaming sea across the sky and will rush to the dome. Yep. <laughs> It'll be like rush seating. If you can get there with your red jersey on, you get to watch them play. Whoever it is that's in town this week. Yep. <laughs> Whoever we could sneak it over the border. All right. Well, Matt, I'll talk to you next week. Yep. And as always, go Flames go whenever they play. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.